Hello everyone, welcome to Rasayan Academy once again guys. So here we are discussing another important short topic on the stereochemistry that is the steric effects, right? So we are talking about the steric effects in the reactions of cyclohexane, right? So you must have already studied some examples in which a bulky group which is on the axial position is going to cause steric hindrance and sometimes the bulky group is also causing steric assistance. So what are these two terms, steric hindrance and steric assistance, that is what we are going to talk about, okay? So first thing first, the steric effects, what are steric effects? That is uh, caused because of a bulky group, right? So, because of a bulky group, what can happen? It can accelerate a reaction or it can decelerate, which means lower down the rate of a reaction. Okay? So, accelerate is to make a reaction faster and decelerate is to make a reaction slower. Okay, so this is what we are going to talk about in today's uh, session. Okay, and if you already haven't subscribed to the channel, please do because we are going to talk about a lot of important topics over here, right? Okay, so when the acceleration occurs, right, it is called steric assistance or steric acceleration, okay? When the deceleration occurs, it is called steric hindrance, okay? So what is steric hindrance basically? Okay, so you have uh, mostly heard about the steric hindrance and very less about the steric assistance. So let's talk about this. Example number one, as you can see, is the ester hydrolysis. So what are we uh, doing in the ester hydrolysis we are taking two isomers first isomer is a cis isomer that is it is having the enancomeric group what is that a tertiary butyl group yes as you already must know tertiary butyl group is a bulky group and it is going to fix the cyclohexane into just one conformation where the tertiary butyl wants to exist in the equatorial position. Okay, so that's why it's going to be only in the equatorial position in both of these cis and trans isomer. So, accordingly, the ester group could be on the same side. Now, both of these are above the plane in the cis isomer. Okay, so one of them is axial, the other one is equatorial, right. And in the trans isomer, both of them could be above and below like this. So both of them could be equatorial and equatorial in the trans isomer, right? So when we are doing the hydrolysis of these two esters, we find the difference in the rate of the reaction and also we have calculated the difference in the rate constant, right? So the ratio of rate constant of the trans isomer upon the, uh, right, upon the cis isomer that is found out to be 20 which means that somehow the trans is reacting fast and the cis isomer is reacting slow this is what we get from this value the trans is greater than the cis isomer now how is that happening let's see okay so first of all we are talking about the ester hydrolysis of these two cis and trans isomers now first of all guys see when we talk about the mechanism, it's actually very simple. Uh, the ester hydrolysis, as usual, is going to go through a tetrahedral intermediate, right? So the OH- minus is going to attack over the carbonyl of the ester. It's going to give you a tetrahedral intermediate like this. And when the O- minus falls back, the uh, alkoxy going, uh, group is going to get removed. You get the resultant acid. And the same is going to happen in the trans isomer also. You are having the OH- minus attacks over the carbonyl, gives you a tetrahedral intermediate. And when the O- minus falls back and the methoxy removes, you are getting the acid. So if it is so similar, then why there is a difference in the rate? Because this isomer over here, the ester group is already facing a 1,3 diaxial interaction. What is that? So on the third position from the ester itself on both of these sides you are having two hydrogens to cause the steric repulsion okay this is called the one three diaxial interaction right now when you are going from the ester and the when the uh, oh minus attacks the bulk of this tetrahedral intermediate increases and because of that, more steric crowding in the transition state or in the intermediate, right? So there is more steric crowding and that's why the reaction is going to be a little bit slower. Why? Because it does not want crowding. 
isn't it so the first step itself is slow now the removal of this group that is going to be fast okay but the first step is going to be uh, slow over here because of a greater steric crowding what happens in the trans so look over here in the trans compound you are having the ester group on the equatorial position because trans we can keep both of them equatorial right so here when the tetrahedral intermediate forms it is not doing steric repulsion with any of the group which is inside the ring so there is no increase in the steric crowding and the molecule can easily go to the acid by the removal of this group so what happened is when you are facing so in this example you are facing the tetrahedral intermediate is facing a lot of steric repulsion uh, in the transition state in the cis isomer that's why it is going to be slow however no interaction over here no repulsion so that's why the trans is going to be fast and hence you see a difference in the rate constant of trans and cis reaction trans is uh, isomer is giving you hydrolysis 20 times faster than the cis isomer now this is a case of steric hindrance okay this is a case of steric hindrance when being on the actual position causes to slow down the reaction okay so similarly guys the ester hydrolysis and the ester formation if you are having the cis and the trans isomer just like these they are going to be giving you the same ratio okay because the mechanism in both of them involve the tetrahedral intermediate now there is one more factor that you have to consider example number two of steric hindrance only we are talking about so when do we have steric hindrance when the bulk in the transition state is causing to slow down the reaction that is when you have the steric hindrance now once again you have a trans isomer tertiary butyl above and the r group is pointing below and you have a cis isomer over here once again right so what are we doing now the r group is not an alkyl group as you can see over here it is a ester okay nitrobenzoic ester like this so the r is basically this group it is connected through oxygen right it is connected through oxygen so when the oh minus attacks r that is when the oh minus attacks this carbonyl which is connected to the ring with an oxygen right so there is a little bit of a distance from the ring because it is not exactly like this it is in this way the aryl ring is in this way right so the oh minus is attacking on this carbonyl which is a little bit far away from this ring itself okay so is there going to be no steric hindrance there will be as you can see but the rate constant the difference is going to be much lesser because here if you compare in the previous example you had this carbon right on the actual position right connected to this carbon okay but here the attack where where it is taking place the tetrahedral intermediate that forms it is one atom away from the ring so the effect of steric hindrance is still there but it is less pronounced only 2.5 uh, the trans isomer is going to be 2.5 times faster than the cis isomer okay so yeah the same mechanism cis isomer you are going to hydrolyze through the uh, tetrahedral intermediate just that one atom above uh, one atom away one oxygen atom away that's why less pronounced okay so these are the two examples of steric hindrance that is when it causes to slow down the reaction steric hindrance that is axial isomer is going to react slow just that okay that is steric hindrance now sometimes it also happens that the actual isomer is reacting fast okay so the actual isomer is reacting fast when does that happen that happens and we call it steric acceleration that is because of bulk we are getting a faster reaction that is steric acceleration so let's see the example see this is the example for the steric acceleration that is sn1 hydrolysis reaction 
so if you see it's a very very simple example guys if you see this is your cis isomer once again which is having the axial and equatorial groups this is your trans isomer having both of them equatorial right so you have a tosylate over here and what happens is you are doing hydrolysis now tosylate is going to remove it's going to give you a carbocation through the sn1 mechanism let's say right so sn1 mechanism will be you know more preferable if you are having a bulky group okay so the carbocation after the hydrolysis you know after the carbocation formation is going to give you is going to give you an oh now the oh could be above or below so we are not mentioning the stereochemistry of the oh right it could be above or it could be below so what we have to think about is basically what we have to think about is basically the carbocation formation who is going to give a fast carbocation formation the tosylate which is on the axial position is going to leave faster because it is bulky in nature right so because of its bulk because of its bulk it is going to like push it off faster because it wants to be stable carbocation is planar isn't it and on the other hand the equatorial tosylate it doesn't have a problem it doesn't have any 1 3 diaxial interactions as the cis is having right so why will it want to push it away so that's why the reaction of eliminating the tosylate is going to be slow when it is on the equatorial position it's going to be fast when it is on the axial position so this is a case when the axial isomer is reacting faster because it wants to push away the bulky group as soon as possible so steric acceleration for the axial isomer okay yes moving onwards example number 4 now this is once again the second example of steric assistance see what is happening assistance once again means that is you are having steric acceleration or the reaction is uh, faster for the axial isomer faster for axial isomer okay so this is the chromic acid oxidation of your alcohol so basically we have once again got the cis isomer over here which is once again axial and equatorial so guys it's not necessary that you always take the 1 4 isomer um you can take the 1 3 isomer also you can take the 1 uh, 2 uh, isomer also it is just that i'm showing you an example okay all i want to uh, you to understand is that the cis isomer will have one group in the axial position when it is 1 4 like this and it will already have a 1 3 diaxial interaction that is more important so you will rather write it as the axial isomer okay now also what happens is you are having another molecule that is the trans isomer right over here the oh is on the equatorial position so you call it the equatorial isomer okay so we are going to see the reactivity of both of these with chromic acid oxidation so what do we do in the chromic acid oxidation let's see first of all this is your alcohol the mechanism of the chromic uh, chromic acid oxidation is very simple the alcohol attacks on chromium or let's say chromic oxide cro3 one of the bonds is going to open up it's going to take away a proton from here and this is the ester molecule that you get what is it chromate ester this is a chromate ester all right now chromate ester also guys now next it is going to take away a proton from here on the same carbon to which the oxygen is connected remove the bond like this and leave so it is going to leave who is going to leave cr double bond o oh hold twice this species is going to leave and you will have a ketone which is now planar 
So once again you see the difference that from a tetrahedral carbon it has gone to a planar carbon. So this reaction is releasing, this is already releasing the strain, isn't it? From sp3 to sp2, right. Now the same reaction will happen for the trans. As you can see the same reaction will happen for the trans. First of all you form the chromate ester. It's going to take away the axial proton and it's going to leave from here. Okay, and give you the planar ketone. So yes, according to you, which reaction is faster? Because once again, it is removing a group. So which one should be faster? The one who readily wants to remove. So the axial isomer is one who readily wants to push away the proton and it wants the chromate to leave. Okay. So because of that, see what happens is, the first step is a fast step because it's a two-step reaction, guys. Okay. So the first step is the attack of oxygen on the chromium. That is a fast step in both of these reactions. Okay. That's not the rate determining step. The rate determining step or the slow step is where the proton is being taken away intramolecularly where the oxidation is taking place. So this is a slow step over here, rate determining one. Okay. In the equatorial isomer, that is in the trans isomer, once again, first step is the OH attack on the chromium. This is supposed to be fast, okay, to form the chromate ester. The second step is the rate determining step. Now, the rate determining step of the equatorial isomer is four times slower. What does that mean? That means because it is having low hindrance, because it is having low hindrance from the actual hydrogens or the whole molecule, the reaction, the molecule does not want to push away the chromate easily and it is going to be four times slower. So once again what happened? The actual isomer, it is going to give you a faster reaction just because there was steric hindrance on the actual position. Okay, so there are four examples that we have seen for the steric effect. Let's revise once again. So this is your steric effects over here. Okay, so it can accelerate a reaction. It can de uh, decelerate a reaction. In the case of ester hydrolysis, from starting to the end, okay, so from starting to the end, you have a carbonyl over here and you still have a carbonyl over here so there is no removal of anything and instead you are getting a big bulky uh, uh, intermediate in between right so this is a case of steric hindrance slow reaction for axial isomer so axial isomer is slow that is when you call it steric hindrance once again the ester hydrolysis just one atom away Okay, so this is also ester hydrolysis only. This is also ester hydrolysis, which is one atom away from the ring. Okay, that also is a case of steric hindrance because you have still the trans reaction better than the cis, just that the effect is less pronounced because of the distance there is less steric hindrance right okay moving onwards to third example steric acceleration happened because the actual isomer is reacting faster because the bulk wants to be removed easily okay you are going from a tetrahedral to a planar carbon that is why it's you know and that also in the rate determining step yes the loss of the leaving group is the rate determining step in the sn1 reaction right Yes, you know that. Okay, so that's why it is steric acceleration. Chromic acid oxidation, once again, that going from tetrahedral to planar and in the rate determining step itself, it is the one, it is the group which is leaving. That's why the slow step is still faster than the trans isomer. Okay, guys. So, two examples of steric hindrance and two examples of steric acceleration. So what you can do is now you can open up your PYQs and you can start solving questions because I think that now this concept should be clear to all of you and more such videos are going to come up and yes, if you haven't already subscribed, please do and I'll see you in the next video.